welcome to the law offices of C.R. Abrams. Hello, my name is Christopher Abrams and I'm the lead attorney here at the Law Offices of C.R. Abrams. Uh, we've been in practice for approximately 25 years. I've been at this location for approximately 10 years. I have a great staff. My uh, junior attorney is Neil Negretti. Our staff is Raymond Ramos and Mabel Becerra. Very good people, very knowledgeable, and they will be able to answer any questions you may have. Um, I've been in practice for about 25 years, passed the bar in 1994. I've only done estate planning, I've done nothing else. Uh, I've focused my practice on uh, estate planning. I figured it was the best way to utilize my skills. I've always been sort of a numbers person and I really enjoy estate planning and helping people uh, come up with estate plans. What I'm planning to do today is kind of give you an outline on what an estate plan is, what documents should be uh, included in the estate plan, and why you need to have a type of estate plan with a trust. What's included with the estate plan is a revocable trust, last will and testament, financial power of attorney, advanced health care directive, certification of trust, all the documents you're going to need in order to make sure that your affairs are taken care of when you pass away or when you become incompetent. When an individual passes away, there are three different types of scenarios an individual can have. One is they pass away without a will, two, they pass away with a will, or three, they pass away with a trust. I'm going to go over all three of them with you and tell you the pros and cons for each. If an individual passes away without a will, California law states that a will is written for them. It is called the intestacy statute, and California basically writes a will for you. Now, um, an individual will, if passes away, if an individual passes away, they will be able to give their assets to spouse and kids. If no spouse and kids, it goes to parents. If no parents, it goes to brothers and sisters. If no brothers and sisters, it goes to the kids of brothers and sisters. Now, every member of that class is to be included. So if you like two of your siblings but don't like a third, unfortunately that third is going to, that third person is going to receive uh, assets out of your estate. Uh, the second scenario is if an individual passes away with a will. Now with a will, an individual gets to dictate who's going to be their executor. That's the individual that oversees the distribution of the estate. And they're going to get to be who their beneficiaries are. Now there is no law that indicates who you have to give your assets to. You may give your assets to anybody, anything, any entity. You can give it to a charity. Uh, in addition, you don't have to give it equally. If you like one child over another, you can certainly give everything to the one child and specifically exclude the other child. There is no, um, like I said, no law or anything that indicates that you must give your assets to anybody or any entity. You're free to do with it what you want. Now, the problem with having a will is it requires a probate proceeding. Now, a probate proceeding is a probate's a special type of court in California that deals with the distribution of your assets upon your passing. Probate um, is necessary when an individual does not have a will or if an individual does have a will. Uh, probate proceeding really consists of three different parts. The first is uh, getting the petition for probate or a petition for probate approved by the judge. That's when the judge indicates who the executor of the will is or the administrator if there is no will, which is basically the person in charge. Uh, that individual is going to be the res person responsible for making sure that all debts are paid, uh, all the uh, procedures and requirements are followed, and is going to be basically responsible for the trust estate. Now, a uh, executor or an administrator, well, if an executor would be somebody that you named in your will, an administrator is an individual who's appointed by the court when you didn't have a will. The probate, the petition for probate is going to go through all of these scenarios and make sure everything is taken care of according to the judge. 
Now, once the individual is uh, appointed as administrator or executor of the estate, then that individual has really two different jobs. One is inventorying all of the assets in the deceased individual's estate on the date they passed away. And the second is to make sure all creditors are satisfied. California law requires that all creditors be satisfied prior to any sort of distribution taking place. Uh, you have to go to the judge to make sure that everything is okay. If you want to sell the property, you have to go to the judge to make sure that it's okay, unless you're granted certain powers through the probate proceeding. Uh, as I indicated, all creditors have to be satisfied. And once all the creditors are satisfied and everything has been appraised, then the estate can get ready for distribution. Uh, once the estate is ready for distribution, a final petition has to be uh, filed with the judge, indicating to the judge everything that's happened during the probate estate, uh, how much money is left, who the creditors were, and who the beneficiaries of the estate are. Uh, and here in Orange County, LA County, uh, petitions for uh, final distribution are usually taking anywhere from two to three months to get on calendar. So as you can see, going through all of these different procedures, it's about a 12 to 16 month process. There's really no way to shorten it. Some people will say, well, they need money, so on and so forth. Uh, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to get the uh, estate closed any quicker. In California, uh, fees are set statutorily. It's a percentage of the estate. 4% for the first 100,000, 3% for the next 100,000, 2% up to a million. So whatever the value of your estate is, that's going to be the fees that are due. Now the fees are due to an executor or your executrix, and they're also due to the attorney. So depending on the size of your estate, if you have a million dollar estate, you're probably looking at about $25,000 in fees. In California, the fees are statutorily set. It's comprised on a percentage of the overall value of the estate. Now, the value of the estate is determined by the gross value, not the net value. So any sort of mortgages are not taken into account in determining the value of the estate. The values are determined by what's called a probate referee. California has certain individuals that have been certified by the state in order to value assets. So they're the ones that are going to determine the value, of your, uh, the value of the estate to determine the fees. In addition, California probates usually take about 12 months, 16 months, uh, anywhere between that is normal. Uh, if there's any sort of contest or people complaining or something of that nature, it's not unheard of to be two or three years. So probate is what you really want to avoid. Probate costs time and probate costs money. So what would be a good way to get out of probate? A revocable trust. Now, a revocable trust is an entity or a contract for when you die that basically does the same thing as a will, tells you who your beneficiaries are, who's going to be in charge of the estate, that would be the successor trustee. But the most important thing is a revocable trust avoids a probate proceeding. You are able to avoid the probate proceeding with a revocable trust and no court supervision is going to be required. Now that's not to say that you can't go to court in the future if somebody should do something wrong, the trustee stealing fees, anything of that nature, but you only go into court if there's a problem. Whereas if you have a will or no will, you go into the probate courts to begin with and have to deal with the time and expense that was mentioned before. So by far the best way to have your estate is to have a revocable trust. It's the most efficient and quickest way to get your assets distributed to your heirs. If there's no house that needs to be sold, then your estate, the trust estate, can usually be wound up within four or five months of the date of death. Whereas, like I said, a will or a null will going through the probates will be 12 to 16 months.
A trust will have, has to have three different parties. It has to have a trustor, those are these individuals whose assets are placed into the trust estate. It has a trustee, that's the individual who's responsible for uh, taking care of the trust estate. And there's also beneficiaries, these are the individuals who ultimately will receive the assets. A trust has to have those three uh, individuals or entities, otherwise the trust will fail because it's incomplete. Um, a trust is also much more capable of putting strings on the money. For example, if you want your children to get a third at age 21, a third at age 25, and a third at age 30, a trust is able to do that. Say you want the trust to wait five years after you pass away before distributing assets. A trust can do that. So a trust is much more malleable with respect to different conditions and strings according to the beneficiaries. Now, an individual or a beneficiary may be on uh, governmental assistance. There's a certain clause within the trust called a special needs trust that uh, can allow a beneficiary to receive uh, governmental benefits when an individual is to receive a distribution. It goes into a special type of trust and essentially the government doesn't really um, count those assets as the individuals. Uh, I'm not going to get much more into special needs trusts, but if you'd like we can certainly you can give us a call and we'd be happy to give uh, any sort of information with the trust to you. If an individual is on Medi-Cal, not Medicare, but Medi-Cal, and they have a trust, as the law currently stands today, Medi-Cal or the state of California is not able to recover against assets that are, ass that are titled in the name of a trust. As long as the asset's titled in the name of the trust, it is not subject to recovery from the state, which is a good thing because any assets that are not in a trust or do not have a beneficiary are subject to recovery by the state of California if the deceased individual or their spouse received any sort of Medi-Cal benefits during their lifetime. Um, a trust also, in a case of a married couple, would allow a full step up in basis because one of the documents on our estate plan is what's called a community property agreement. The community property agreement indicates that all of your assets that have been transferred into the trust shall be considered community property. It is easy to change a trust. Uh, amendments can be, do the, be done to the trust, um, which allows you to change the distribution pattern or the successor trustees at any time. Uh, here at C.R. Abrams, we charge a flat rate of $100 per amendment. It's not an hourly fee or anything like that, it's just a flat hundred dollars. Now many people will uh, have heard the golf club, the bridge game, whatever it may be, that they can put their children on title of their assets and that's going to avoid probate. Uh, that's what's called joint tenancy. Now you can have joint tenancy either with a real property, put your children on the title of real property, or you can have joint owners or joint tenants on bank accounts or financial accounts. If you place your children on title to your house or title of your bank accounts, you're exposing yourself to two different problems. First, by putting your children on the account or on the property, that's considered a gift because they didn't pay any sort of money to be put on that on title. So that would be considered a gift and subject to federal gift tax laws. Now you may not know this, but gift tax is paid by the person giving the gift not the person receiving the gift. It's always the person giving the gift that's subject to the tax. Now there are ways around the tax, filing a 709 tax return and other things, but um, those are pretty complicated and also cost money in order to file with the IRS. 
Second, and most importantly, if you place your children on title of your assets and your children should be sued for whatever reason, then those assets that their names are on are going to be subject to a judgment. If your child was to get in a car wreck and get a judgment against him or her, uh, it's possible that they could attach your assets. Now you may go to the judge and say, Your Honor, those are my assets and the <clears throat> my son never owned any of these assets. I just put them on to avoid probate. The courts are not going to care. Uh, if you're on title of those assets or if your kids are on title of those assets and they get uh, sued, your assets could be subject to a judgment, which you want to avoid. Now, as I indicated before, if you put your assets in a trust, they will avoid probate. So you won't have to deal with these types of issues. With respect to deeds, there's really three different ways to hold title. Uh, there's joint tenancy, there's community property, and there's tenants in common. I'm going to go over each of them with you and explain to you the pros and cons of each. Uh, the first is uh, community property. Now community property can only be held between husband and wife. Kids cannot hold property as community property with parents. Brothers and sisters can't hold it as community property. Only husband, only spouses can be held, can hold property as community property. Now, if you're married, holding property as community property is advantageous for two ways. One, if one spouse passes away, the other spouse automatically receives the deceased spouse's half by operation of law. No probate receding is required. All that's required is an affidavit filed with the county recorder indicating that the individual has passed away. More importantly, and secondly, is that if an individual holds title as community property and one spouse passes away, the other spouse gets a full step up in basis in the property for capital gains tax purposes. Now this uh, recording is a little bit limited and I can't really go into the uh, details of a step up in basis, but understand that if, a if an asset is held in community property, the surviving spouse will get a full step up in basis for the entire property for capital gains tax purposes. The second way to hold title is joint tenancy. Uh, joint tenancy can be held between any two people, any three people, any number of people. They don't have to be spouses, they can be brother and sister, they could be strangers, they can be friends. Anybody can hold title as joint tenants. Now joint tenancy is a last person standing. If four people own a piece of property in joint tenancy and three of the individuals pass away, the surviving joint tenant is a 100% owner in the property. It doesn't matter if the three individuals that passed away um, also had wills saying the property went somewhere else. Joint tenancy is an operation of law and it will supersede whatever a will or trust says. So joint tenancy will avoid probing. However, a problem with joint tenancy like I mentioned before is that a owner is subject to the liabilities or any sort of judgments against any of the other joint tenants. Uh, so if you hold title in joint tenancy, you may uh, avoid probate, but you're exposing yourself to the liabilities of other individuals. Another way to hold title is what's called tenants in common. Now tenants in common can be held by anybody, uh, spouses, friends, strangers, doesn't matter. You can still hold it in, as tenants in common. And tenants in common differs from joint tenancy in that each tenant in common's share is separated from the rest. So if two individuals own a piece of property in tenants in common and one of the individuals gets sued, the other individual is not subject to the liabilities of the other individual. However, if a property is held in tenants in common and one of the individuals passes away, that individual's portion would be subject to probate because it does not automatically go to the other, joint, uh, other tenant in common. Uh, tenants in common uh, allow for the separation of each individual's interest. So while uh, it's great that you're not subject to the liabilities of the other uh, tenant, you are going to have to go through probate with respect to that individual's portion. Now, California also allows for a beneficiary designation on deeds. It's called a transfer on death deed. California allowed this a couple years ago and they're kind of going through the growing pains trying to make, see if this is going to be a good thing to do. Um, 
transfer on death deeds have a lot of requirements and they need to be specifically or they need to be done in a specific way in order to be valid. We can answer any questions you have about transfer on death deeds. However, um, I'm not a big fan of them right now just because things that you have to do in order to make them valid um, are pretty onerous and you need to make sure that everything takes place. Otherwise, if the transfer on death deed fails, that asset is going to be subject to, the pro to a probate proceeding. The estate plan includes a revocable trust, uh, community property agreement, assignment of personal property, last will and testaments, financial powers of attorney, advanced health care directives, uh, statements of desire regarding long-term care, uh, certification of trust, and all the transfer documentation necessary in order to transfer your assets into the trust. Uh, the revocable trust is the cornerstone of the estate plan. The revocable trust is going to be your distribution document that's going to indicate who receives what out of your estate, who's in charge of your estate, who's responsible to pay the bills, and so on. A community property agreement is an agreement that a married couple would sign. Community property agreements are only for a joint trust. Uh, and the community property agreement's main benefit is that when one spouse passes away, the other spouse will receive a full step-up basis in the, in the asset on the date of death or to the date of death value. The community property agreement's main benefit is for the surviving spouse to receive a stepped-up basis in an asset after the death of one spouse. If a husband and wife only own assets in joint tenancy, the surviving spouse will only receive a step-up basis in one half of the asset. It's prudent to have the community property agreement so the surviving spouse will receive a step-up basis in 100% of the property. The drawback for a community property agreement is that any assets that were titled or considered separate property um, prior to the signing of the community property agreement, once that community property agreement is signed, every asset will be considered community property whether or not the asset is titled in one spouse's name alone. Therefore, if there's ever a divorce and the community property agreement has been signed, all assets will be considered community property and any assets owned prior to the marriage will not be separate property of the individual. An assignment of personal property is a document that takes things like furniture, furnishings, TVs, paintings, things of that nature and consider them part of the trust because most of the time those types of assets do not have certificates of title. We also include a specific gift form that allows an individual to indicate who should receive a specific gift of personal property. For example, if you want your tools to go to your son or your wedding rings to go to your daughter, uh, you're able to indicate that uh, on the specific gift form. Even though an individual or a joint couple has a revocable trust, you will also have a will. The will's main purpose is really nothing more than a safety net because a will is only used through a probate proceeding and by having a revocable trust or an estate plan with a revocable trust as its cornerstone, we're trying to avoid probate. So ideally, the last will and testaments are never used. However, they need to be there in case there was an asset at the time of death that was not titled in the name of the trust, did not have a beneficiary designation, or did not have a joint owner. If none of those uh, characteristics were present at the time of death, that asset is going to be subject to a probate proceeding. In a probate proceeding, your last will and testament is the controlling document. Now the will within the estate plan is going to indicate that the trust is the beneficiary of any assets that go through the probate proceeding. And therefore the asset will pour back into the trust and be distributed pursuant to the terms of the trust. Uh, in legal parlance, this is considered what's called a pour-over will. It works in conjunction with the revocable trust. 
A financial power of attorney is a document that allows you to indicate who should make decisions for you in the case you become incompetent. Now, the, power, the financial powers of attorney that are in my estate plan um, are what are called springing powers of attorney, in that they only spring into effect upon a certain condition. That condition being when two doctors certify in writing that you're no longer competent. Once those two letters are obtained, the power of attorney springs into effect and then the named agents can make financial decisions on behalf of the incompetent individual. Now note, financial powers of attorney only work for non-trust assets. Trust assets uh, must be controlled by the successor, by the trustee then serving. Now, a individual is also removed as a trustee if they become incompetent. So the trigger is the same. However, trust assets require trusteeship. Uh, Non-trust assets require the financial power of attorney. In addition, the financial power of attorney only works after, as I indicated, after you become incompetent. So if an individual passes away from a hard attack or, heaven forbid, has a horrible car accident, the financial power is never used because the individual never became incompetent. An advanced health care directive allows an individual to indicate agents to make health care decisions for them in the event they're unable to. In addition, an advanced health care directive allows you to indicate whether or not you want to be kept alive on life support or a DNR designation and it also allows you to indicate if you want to donate any organs and if so how you want those organs to use and which organs may be harvested after your passing. A certification of trust is a condensed version of the big trust and is usually the document that financial institutions will make copies of in order to prove the existence of your trust. A certification of trust has all the information necessary to title your assets into the name of the trust and allows or indicates the uh, uh, social security number of the trust, who the beneficiaries are, which are the client, not the other beneficiaries, and it allows for other ins uh, financial institutions to uh, know what the trustee's powers are. Statements of desire regarding long-term care are statements where you indicate that if you're ever institutionalized for any reason whatsoever, you want to come home if at all possible. The main purpose for the statement of desire regarding long-term care is to allow a spouse or a successor trustee to let a skilled nursing facility know that you intended to return home. Because if you become incompetent and are placed into a skilled nursing facility, you lose the ability to tell the facility that you would like to go home. Uh, once you become incompetent, the facility, or anybody for that matter, uh, really doesn't have to listen to you anymore because the law states that because of your incompetency, uh, you don't know what you're saying and you cannot be held legally bound by whatever you say. An important task which is done after you sign the trust is what's called funding the trust. Now funding the trust is very important because you want to make sure that the trust will govern or control as many assets as possible after you pass away. Uh, real property almost always goes into the trust. Financial accounts almost always go into the trust. Um, pretty much everything goes into the trust with the exception of what are called qualified accounts. Qualified accounts are accounts where there is some sort of tax deferred component to it. IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, tax deferred annuities. These types of accounts do not get transferred into the trust. This is due to the fact that if the account is transferred to the name of the trust, the IRS considers that a complete withdrawal and therefore all income taxes due on the amounts that are transferred into the trust. 
So you may be thinking, well, how do these assets avoid probate? These types of assets avoid probate by means of a beneficiary designation. If you're married, your spouse is almost always the primary beneficiary here in California. If your spouse is not the primary beneficiary or you want to name somebody other than your spouse as a primary beneficiary, you must get your spouse's consent in writing before the financial institution will change that beneficiary designation. Uh, the secondary beneficiary can be kids, can be anybody else, could be a charity if you want. But you always want at least a primary beneficiary and a secondary beneficiary on those types of tax deferred accounts. Other types of assets that don't go into a trust usually are life insurance policies. Uh, life insurance policies are usually, usually owned by the individual. Uh, however, the trust could be named as a beneficiary. If you would like those assets to be, uh, that death benefit, to be put into the trust or to be distributed pursuant to the terms of the trust, you could indicate the trust as the beneficiary. And therefore, once you pass away, the trustee would submit your death certificate to the uh, life insurance company and the death benefit would be paid to the trust. The monies would be deposited into the trust bank account and distributed according to its terms. Um, if your children are the named beneficiaries of your trust, you may want to just name the children directly as the contingent or secondary beneficiaries if you're married or the primary beneficiaries if you're not married. Uh, the reason being is that the kids will get the money quicker if they're named directly as beneficiaries because then the kids only have to give the death certificate to the life insurance company and the life insurance company within 30 days has to make the death benefit payable to the named beneficiaries. So they will get the money quicker and they will be able to utilize the money faster than if the money flows through the trust. Now sometimes people will have strings attached to certain beneficiaries designations uh, within the trust and if that's the case and you want those strings to be attached to the life insurance death benefit then you'd have to name the trust as the beneficiary because a life insurance company is not going to allow for uh, intricate or very difficult distributions to occur by means of just a beneficiary designation. You'd really have to have that money flow through the trust. In funding the trust, we prepare all the documentation for you to fund your trust. However, it is the client's responsibility to make sure that the assets actually get funded into the trust. What does this mean? This means that you will need to take the deed to the county recorder to have the deed recorded transferring the asset into the trust. You will need to go to your financial institution, take your binder with you, and be sure that the accounts get transferred into the name of the trust. We don't do that for you. We prepare the documentation for you, but it is your responsibility to make sure that those documents get to the appropriate parties and that your assets get transferred into the trust. It is very important that the assets be transferred into the trust. Where clients usually make a mistake is we prepare a beautiful estate plan, transfer all the assets into the trust, and then sometimes subsequent to the signing of the trust, they purchase another piece of property, open up another bank account, whatever the asset may be, and they forget to take title in the name of the trust. They then pass away, the asset's not titled in the name of the trust, and then we have to go through a probate proceeding. This is what we're trying to avoid with this type of estate plan. So you want to be sure that after the documents are signed that your trust is funded. Very, very important. I cannot overstate the uh, importance of funding the trust correctly. I hope you find this information helpful. Uh, having a revocable trust is truly a great way to allow your beneficiaries or your heirs to receive the money quicker than if they have to go through a probate proceeding. They will almost always receive the money quickly and they will receive more assets because as I indicated before, probates are time and money and you really don't want to waste your time and you don't want to waste the beneficiary's money on having to go through a probate proceeding. That's why a revocable trust is used by many, many people in the United States and is a, a, a wonderful vehicle in order to avoid the probate process. Now the estate plan also allows for situations if you become incompetent. Uh, we have documents in there to be sure, financial power of attorney, uh, most importantly, to allow individuals to make 
financial decisions and medical decisions for you in the event that you become incompetent. So the estate plan really deals with two different scenarios. One is death and one is incompetency. Uh, if you don't have any of these documents uh, and you pass away, you're going through a probate proceeding. If you become incompetent and don't have any documents, that's what's all called a conservatorship. Conservatorships are also very expensive and time consuming and a lot of times they can get very contentious because different people will want to make decisions for you. Some kids will think they're more um, uh, available, they're uh, more in tune to your wishes than other children and obviously that can create some conflict within a family and we really don't want to have these types of conflicts within a family at this type of time, whether incompetency or before death. Uh, because usually what will take place is the families will split apart.